Okay, everybody, let's get started with our second talk tonight. And crabgrass is one of the most common grassy weeds in our lawns. And here to teach us how to control this weed is Esther McGinnis. Esther is an extension horticulturist and director of the NDSU Extension Master Gardener Program. And her graduate students conduct research in the areas of native plant evaluation, pollinator conservation, and plants for rain garden environments. As the administrator of the Extension Master Gardener Program, impactful initiatives of hers include planting pollinator habitat and fighting food insecurity, and then community beautification, as well as plant diagnosis. So Esther, welcome to the forums. Thank you very much. Welcome. All right. Well, thank you for inviting me to speak. And believe it or not, we're almost to the point where we would be putting down our crabgrass preventers. I mean, this is so strange to me because last year, I still remember we were having blizzards. And in fact, I missed a couple of my speaking engagements because there was no travel advice last year at this time. Um, so we're, we're in for a very different spring than last year. But I also need to give credit where credit is due, Tom. Um, so you'll Yolanda Schmidt um, helped with this. Uh, she actually wrote this PowerPoint. Um, so Yolanda was my um, was my grad student, and in fact, uh, she got her master's in extension education. So I was her advisor, and we worked together on uh, a package program regarding crabgrass management. So I can't take all the credit here. So what's the problem with crabgrass? Well, the problem is that um, this is the most common annual weedy grass that we have. Um, here, let me just hide this, there we go. <clears throat> so crabgrass is the most common annual weedy grass that we have, um, and it's a warm season grass. One of the big problems though, is it produces a ton of seed and that seed will form a seed bank in your soil. So once you have it, you will have it for years because it will continue to germinate each year. And then we have not one, but two species of crabgrass. We have smooth and large crabgrass. And then what makes them undesirable in our lawns is that they really don't have aesthetic qualities. Um, so they, they're actually quite ugly. They have a coarse texture. When you look at crabgrass, it's got a leaf blade that is much wider than you would find with respect to our desirable turf grasses like Kentucky bluegrass, our fine fescues and perennial ryegrass. And then it has a color that makes it stand out. So it's kind of yellowish green in color instead of being that deep green that we want to see in our lawns. Um, it's also very competitive. It grows fast. And then it crowds out our desirable turf grasses. Um, with this being an annual, it will then die come fall. And then it'll leave bare, sp bare patches in spring. It has some competitive advantages here. So I mentioned that it had this tremendous uh, seed bank in the soil and it germinates when the top two to four inches of the soil starts reaching 55 degrees. And then it will continue to germinate throughout summer. It really likes the soil temperatures between 60 and 70, but you're gonna find that it, it just continues to germinate. And then to make matters worse is that this is a warm season grass. Um, now in if you consider our cool season grasses, which do not thrive during the heat of summer, when you take it and compare it to a warm season grass, that warm season grass is gonna outcompete it. It's gonna thrive during times of drought and in the heat. So that makes crabgrass really a formidable weed in our lawns. We're gonna talk a little bit here about crabgrass identification. So the seedlings aren't very distinctive. They do look a little bit like tiny corn seedlings, but for the average homeowner, you're not gonna notice the seedlings. You'd have to get onto your hands and knees and be searching in the turf grass to find them. This is a stage in which you're more likely to recognize it. So there's, there's a reason why this is called crabgrass. And this is because the, the tillers will lie flat on the ground. And then it just kind of has that crab-like appearance, uh, hence the name crabgrass. 
So other ways to identify it, you can look at the seed head. Now, most of the time, you're not going to see the seed head because the lawnmower may, in fact, uh, cut off the seed head. But sometimes when you allow things to, to grow a little bit taller, or sometimes you'll have the seed head growing sideways into the sidewalk, then you'll be able to see this distinctive seed head. And it's very finger-like in appearance, two to five spikes. And then, of course, the lar large crabgrass has a larger seed head. To distinguish between the two species, we've got smooth crabgrass and large crabgrass. Um, as the name implies, smooth crabgrass doesn't have as many hairs on the stem, but hopefully you can see the photo of large crabgrass. And on that comb, you'll notice that it has uh, a bunch of hairs. So that's an easy way to tell them apart. But for the, for the average homeowner, it's not that important. Um, once you're able to identify that it's a crabgrass, um, it's really the same management strategies, whether it's smooth or large. Now, the big issue is that a lot of our homeowners mistake uh, quackgrass for crabgrass. So you need to be able to distinguish the two of them because they're different management strategies. And quackgrass is a lot harder to control to control compared to crabgrass. Uh, so there's going to be some terms you need to know. So you've got the turf blade, and that's going to be the leafy structure. And then on the bottom is the sheath, and the sheath can be rolled or fo folded. But I'm going to have you focus on the collar region where the blade and the sheath uh, meet. In that collar region, I want you to learn two terms. I want you to learn the term ligule and the term oracle. The ligule will be uh, a, a little piece of tissue that is at the base of the blade, and that's on the back side of the collar. Now, the oracle will be in the front. So hopefully you can see the my cursor here. The oracle's in the front. And if you might want to think of it as arms that are hugging the sheath. So remember those two terms, and that will help you differentiate crabgrass and quackgrass. So showing you the ligule on crabgrass. Now, if you pull back the blade to reveal the collar section, you'll see there's a ligule in crabgrass. So it's that, that tissue-like portion there. Now, you're not seeing the front of the collar. Um, and that's being blocked by the blade. So this is kind of the view from the back. You pull the blade down, and then the ligule pops up. Now, showing you from the side, this is a, a little smaller picture, but you can still see that that membrane there, the ligule, is very prominent. If we look at the front of it, you'll notice we don't have those hugging arms. We don't have an oracle. So no, no oracle in crabgrass. Now, let's contrast that with quackgrass. Quackgrass does have an oracle on the front of it, so that's going to be on the front of the collar. If you were to pull down the blade, there would be a little bit of a ligule, but it's really tiny. It's not prominent like it is on crabgrass. But I want to show you a better picture of that oracle. So you've got the oracle there on the front side of it, um, and that, that's a, a dead giveaway that you've got quackgrass rather than crabgrass. You can also compare the root systems. So quackgrass spreads by rhizomes, and it's really the bane of those of us that have lawns. You know, you'd like to pull it out, but you can't. You've got this underground stem called the rhizome, and the rhizome initiates new tillers. You know, that's the leafy structure coming out the top. And then, of course, you've got uh, the root system on the bottom. But when you see these white, smooth rhizomes, you know you've got quackgrass. In contrast, crabgrass has a fibrous root system. It doesn't spread by rhizomes. It doesn't have stolons. It just has uh, roots that are branched all coming from the main point. All right, to recap that, and then I've got a few new points in here. Crabgrass, remember, is an annual. So it germinates in spring, uh, grows through summer, and then dies uh, with the hard frost. Now we've got quackgrass. Quackgrass is a perennial. Unfortunately, it doesn't die. We all wish it would die, but it doesn't. 
Um, crabgrass is a warm season grass thriving in the summer months. Quackgrass is a cool season grass. You know, so you'll see that um, quackgrass will be one of the first to really green up and become apparent in your lawn this spring. And then going back to the oracles and the ligule, no oracles in crabgrass, but uh, prominent oracles on quackgrass. And then really, just really large membranous ligule on the crabgrass. And then if we look at the habit, that tells us a lot too. Remember the, the crabgrass is spread out like a crab and our quackgrass is gonna go vertical. So you're gonna see the leaf blade growing upwards. And then of course we discussed the difference in the root system. So let's talk management. And frankly, I could probably talk for the next, next 30 minutes on how to manage and how to promote a health dense and vigorous lawn. And that does go a long ways. So we got to look at our cultural practices because if you have a dense lawn that does help uh, prevent some weed germination and, you know, it helps crowd out some of the weeds. So you got to make sure that you, you know, are using the right form of turf grass. Um, so we've got you know, NDSU Extension definitely has recommendations on turf grass. So if, you've, if you're struggling with what you have, we might be able to recommend something to replace it. Um, you know, and then think about mowing. So mowing is so very important and most people are mowing too short. So you want to mow higher. If you can raise that mower deck up to three, three and a half inches, and in some cases, four inches, you're going to find that your lawn is a lot more dense. And then when it's taller, it will in fact shade out some of the weeds. And we know that some of the weeds require light to germinate. So if we can shade them out, that's helpful, you know, um, proper watering is good. So if you want to maintain and have your lawn active through the summer, about an inch of water a week. And then fertilization. Fertilization also helps thicken up the lawn. Um, best time to fertilize is around the Labor Day weekend, um, really the summer holidays. So Memorial Day and then Labor Day if you're irrigating. But despite all, all the things that you are doing to increase the density of your lawn, you still, you're still might have to resort to herbicides because, remember, we've got that seed bank of crabgrass and it just wants to germinate and it, it, will, it will be a problem. So then we can look at a couple different classes of herbicides. So we can use a pre-emergence herbicide or a post-emergence herbicide. Now the pre-emergence herbicide, you would apply it before the seeds germinate and you water it in and essentially forms a barrier on the soil surface. So the seed starts germinating, but it's killed when that first root absorbs that pre-emergence herbicide. So you won't even see it. So it's not a successful germination. Now, if you miss the window of opportunity to put down your pre-emergence herbicide, that's when you would resort to a post-emergence herbicide. You apply that um, after you've had successful germination. We're going to focus on pre-emergence herbicides because it is more economical, but it's also more effective in the long term. So we want to get people in the habit of putting down their pre-emergence herbicides to prevent crabgrass and other weedy grasses from germinating. There are different formulations out there. Most homeowners put down a granular formulation, but our turf grass professionals do also have liquid formulations. Application timing is critical. So we want to apply this uh, approximately one week before the average soil temperature reaches 55 degrees at a four inch depth. So there are different ways of measuring that. Now, hopefully you can see, whoops, I don't know if you can see um, that I've got a little bit of a probe here. So I've got a, a digital thermometer here that looks like a meat thermometer. So hopefully you can see it's got the probe on it and, and that works really well. So just invest in a cheap one. Uh, now, don't take your spouse's roast thermometer. They may not appreciate that, but buy yourself a cheap, uh, a cheap digital 
thermometer and then you can use it to measure soil temperature. You know, measure it in a few spots and then average that together. Um, if you don't want to do that, you can certainly look at our North Dakota Agricultural Weather Network and they do show soil temperatures. As you look at the different cities and towns that show up on this map, you'll see that the first number is the soil temperature of bare soil. We don't care about that. We want the turf soil temperature. So you're looking at the second number. And this is from yesterday. So you, looking at Fargo, our, our turf soil temperature yesterday was about 47. And and really that's to be expected when we're starting to reach 70 degrees. But in the next few days, that temperature may drop again because we're having cooler temperatures. So we're not quite reaching, you know, reaching that stage, but very shortly, if we have a few more days of warm temperatures, we're really going to be in that, in that um, frame where we would be putting down the crabgrass pre-emergence herbicide. And in fact, there may be some areas of your lawn that are warmer than others, areas along your driveway, because you know whether it's asphalt or cement, it's retaining the heat a little bit, areas along your sidewalk and such. So it's important to, to do this. Now, I mentioned in the previous slide, to put it down a week before the soil temperature reaches an average of 55 degrees. So that's really as you're starting to reach 50 degrees. So as you're consistently starting to reach 50 degrees, I would put down the pre-emergence herbicide because as we start to get into that 55 degree range, that's when you're gonna see the beginning of crabgrass seed germination. So if you can get ahead of that, that is wonderful. Our pre-emergence herbicides um, are influenced by the grass species and cultivars that you have in your lawn. And we'll talk a little bit about that. We're gonna talk about the age of your turf. Is it, is it newly seeded or is it an established lawn? And that's gonna affect what products you put down. And then of course your application rate. But no matter what, always read the label, read it thoroughly, you know, make sure that um, the mix of turf grass species that you have in your lawn is is listed as a host here and can um, and can tolerate these pre-emergence herbicides and then look for the weeds uh, the weeds that are listed on there. But I'll certainly show you some different active ingredients here that can be very effective for pre-emergence uh, con control. The most common one has the active ingredient of pendimethalin. And you'll be able to read the, uh, the herbicide bag and you'll see under active ingredients that pendimethalin is, is the chemical that's being used. Now, of course, there are lots of brand names. I'm not able to list all the brand names that provide pendimethalin as their active ingredient in the crabgrass preventer. The second one here is prodiamine. And I would, that's not going to be something that is readily accessible to the homeowner. That's more likely to be purchased by a commercial turf grass company. But I want you to notice that the first two products, they're only effective as a pre emergence herbicide. The third active ingredient, Dithiap, here, um, can provide control as a pre-emergence, but it also has a little bit of post-emergence control too, because they can provide some control for crabgrass seedlings before they tiller. And I'm gonna define tillering here in a few minutes. Um, now, dithiapir, I'm starting to notice, is more commonly available than it used to be. Um, but I do like it because it's a little bit more forgiving. If you've missed that window, you know, you could use Dithiapir and it would be able to take care of the crabgrass seedlings. But we're starting to notice more of that in the big box stores and more available to home consumers. All right, so those were recommendations for established lawns. Now we're gonna look at what you can put on a newly seeded lawn. You don't dare put pendimethalin or, or the others that were mentioned in the, previous, in the previous slide because they will, in fact, prevent your turf grass seed from germinating. So remember, you know, you're, 
you've got you're trying to control a weedy grass, but at the same time you're trying to seed a new lawn here. In that situation, it becomes trickier. So if you use most of the pre-emergence herbicides that I listed previously, it's not going to work in this situation because it would prevent the germination of your Kentucky bluegrass or your fine fescue or whatever grass that you're trying to grow. So in that situation, if you're trying to seed, you would use one of these two products. There's Sigeron, and the brand name on that is 2%, and that is being phased out. I'm not even sure if it's still registered with the EPA. I need to look that up, but I know it's being phased out. And part of the reason is that there's a better product on the market called Mesotrione. So Sigeron was pretty weak um, when it was being used as a pre-emergence in a newly seeded lawn. Mesotrione is, is a little bit better and can provide control for up to four weeks. So you would put down the mesotrione right at seeding or just, just prior to seeding. You don't want to put it down after the seed germinates because mesotrione will cause those seedlings Instead of being green, they'll look kind of bleached and will damage them. So you would put this down at seeding or right before seeding, and then it will provide control from crabgrass and other weed germination for four weeks. Mesotrione can be applied to a Kentucky bluegrass mix as long as the fine fescue component is less than 20%. The fine fescues are a little bit more susceptible um, to mesotrione than Kentucky bluegrass and um, perennial ryegrass. All right, so let's say you got really busy this spring. Let's say you're an extension horticulturist that is traveling all around and neglecting her own lawn and misses the window of opportunity to put down a pre-emergence herbicide. Um, when she gets home, she notices that she's got crabgrass seedlings growing. So what can you do in that situation? You can use a post-emergence herbicide. The post-emergence herbicides are most effective at the seedling stage. So when that newly, newly germinated crabgrass is still pretty small. We do have some herbicides that can be effective in the tiller stage, but I'm going to tell you, this is going to be a little bit more work and you're going to need to do multiple applications. One application may not do it. And then there's a little bit more likelihood that you might injure your desirable turf grasses. Um, but I promised that I would define what a tiller is. Um, so after the crabgrass seedling grows, um, you'll when you just have one, it's a seedling, but you'll notice that we've got these side shoots coming out. So in this in, in this um, photo right here, you'll notice I've got three arrows, hence we have three tillers. That would be at the three tiller stage. Um, and that will become important when we talk about the post-emergence herbicides. So we're gonna cover Dithia here again because Remember, this was the one pre-emergence that has some post-emergence activity. So dithiopyr um, is effective when applied at the seedling stage, um, you know, through the development of leaves. But once it starts sending out tillers, it's not going to be effective. <clears throat> so the two you would rely upon once you reach the tillering stage is phenoxaprop or quinclorac. Now, I have less experience with phenoxaprop. I think the farmers tend to use this a little bit more. And that can provide control after tillering, but the effectiveness decreases as the plant size increases. So quinclorac we see quite a bit now um, on the market. So you'll see like um, ortho weed be gone, is it crabgrass? And that contains quinclorac in it. And quinclorac is quite effective at the seedling stage and um, up through the first tiller. And then there's a little gap. It, when it has two, three, or four tillers, it's not as effective. But then once it reaches five, six, seven tillers, it is effective again. So I don't quite understand why that is the case. But quinclorac works. You know, up until the one tiller stage, less effective, two, three, four tiller stage, and then five on up, and it, it, it's, a little, it's quite effective. Um, but quinclorac is what 
what you'll most likely find in the big box stores now. And, and that's really been very helpful. So as crabgrass grows, um, post-emergence herbicides are less effective. So probably when we reach like mid-July or so, I would say that, you know, it's really not worth it anymore to be spraying a post-emergence herbicide. You're going to have to apply it many times, and there's more of a risk of turf grass injury. But as we get into late summer, you know, um, early fall, it's perfectly acceptable to give up for the year. So remember, crabgrass is an annual. So if, if you haven't been keeping up with it, the crabgrass um, will in fact die come winter. And then you have next spring, you know, to get on top of it to apply the pre-emergence herbicides. So in conclusion, the most effective crabgrass control is achieved when we use um, a variety of methods. So when we use our cultural practices to make sure we've got a healthy, dense lawn, and then when we use effective chemical weed control strategies, my advice would be to make sure you do the pre-emergence herbicide. But if you if you in fact miss out on that window, then you can resort to the post-emergence herbicides. But remember, Anytime you're using a pesticide, the label is the law. So read that label, know how much to apply, make sure you follow it and use the label rate and um, be very cautious as you're doing so. So do we have a plethora of questions now? Okay, if anybody has any questions, please type them in the question and answer box. And we do have a, a few questions right away, Esther. You did mention about the importance of timing to put a pre-emergence herbicide on. Does it hurt if you, like now the weather's nice, is it okay if we put it on a little bit earlier than the perfect time? Yes, yes. I Actually, we're starting, we're starting to get there. Um, one thing I'm noticing here in Fargo is that we have forsythia blooming and in some other states they use forsythia as their indicator plant. Um, now we haven't done the tests to confirm that that works in North Dakota, but it really seems like we're, we're going to get there very fast. Now, if we were living in Alabama or something like that, um, it would be a different story, but our growing season is short enough that you can put it down you can put it down a little bit early and it should be effective through the summer months. So you're not going to be having an issue with it if you do apply it a little on the early side. Yeah, it'll just wear out faster, and but mm -hmm. it'll still give you good control through much of the summer. Yep. Absolutely. Okay, good. How about, uh, you know, as far as recommendations for the, does it matter what type of lawn we have, like a tall fescue or Kentucky bluegrass, is that affected by this? Your crabgrass <laughs> recommendations, does that matter? What type of lawn you have? Um, it does when it comes to the fine fescues. I'd have to I'd have to look back up on the tall fescues, but the the fine fescues are a little bit more sub subject to damage from um mesotrione and such. Mm -hmm. But there's also a little bit of difference, you know, when it comes to the post-emergence herbicide. So that's why it's so important to read the label. But if you are applying a pre-emergence herbicide to an established lawn, it should not matter. It, it really shouldn't matter. Uh, how do these herbicides affect pollinators? Um, these herbicides um, do not directly impact pollinators um, per se. However, um, if you're putting down pre-emergence, they can indirectly affect them by, in fact, controlling for some of the from the weedy flowers that that germinate. So, you know, say for example, dandelions and such. So, when we do control for um, control for weeds in our lawn, there are fewer flowers for the bees. So that's certainly that's certainly uh, an impact, but it's an indirect impact. These particular herbicides uh, do not seem to be um, affecting bee health other than the fact that it's depriving them of the flowers, the nectar and the pollen that they need. Okay, how do these crabgrass herbicides affect broadleaf plants, for example, nearby shrubs, trees? Okay, okay, I would stay, I would stay away. Um, I would stay away from them per se. 
Uh, so we want to make sure that we are not spraying, particularly our post-emergence. So that that's the thing is that, okay, we, we do want to keep these away from the trees and whatnot. Now, when it comes to pendimethalin, that's that's less of an issue. The pre-emergence like that is less of an issue. It's the post-emergence that we want to stay away from. I wouldn't want to be spraying quinclorac anywhere close to a tree. I, I also wouldn't want to be having mesotrione close to trees either. So we've seen some damage from that. Okay. How do we figure out how much herbicide to apply and about a re-entry interval when it's safe to go back on the lawn? Okay, so that's going to differ per product. So make sure that you read the label and that you are, in fact, using the labeled rate. You, some people will try and go lower, but in fact, we find that that is counterproductive. So I would use the labeled rate and I would use it based on the type of spreader that you have. Okay, I know we're talking about crabgrass, but you did, you did mention quackgrass. Yes. So do you have any quick recommendations on dealing with quack grass? Yes. You can. Unfortunately, we do not have a selective herbicide that will take quack grass out of our desirable turf grass. So in that situation, we try, number one, to keep our desirable turf grass as dense as possible. Um, if, in fact, you're quack grass infestation has taken over what you would do in that situation if it's really bothering you is that you would take it out with a non-selective herbicide like glyphosate which is in roundup um, so you would spray out that area but you're going to be killing the desirable turf grass in that area too so once you've killed the quack grass you might have to spray twice I'm going to be honest here. You might have to spray twice to totally kill the quack grass. Um, you would then reseed. So unfortunately, we don't have an easy answer. There are some individuals that will go out and um, try and hit the quack grass, you know, using a little paintbrush and trying to avoid the, the other turf grass. But I don't have patience for that. I just don't. Okay, are there any, let's see, any last questions? I think you got it all covered here. Thanks, Esther. That was a great presentation. We're ready to attack that crabgrass. Perfect yes, timing. Yes. Okay, thanks. But, oh, okay, just, are, just one thing. I, please, I just want to make please. sure with, with the herbicides, we do want to stay away from the trees. So we do want to stay away from the trees. So I do want to emphasize that. Okay, so how close can a tree, like our lawn has trees on it. So mm -hmm. like how far, what are you, what are you mentioning there? Like, Well, and, and that's, if you do have trees in your lawn, I would stay outside the mulch line for sure. Okay. So I think that would be good. Okay, that's very helpful. Mm -hmm.